sounds here. They're always so peaceful. Bubble is a movie that's going to see its fair share of criticism in a completely justified way. It's average at best, showing off some stunning animation from Wit Studio, but lacking in most other departments. Underneath the beautiful complexity of this post-disaster Tokyo, there's an absolute mess. The physicality of the plot boils down to Bubbles destroyed the world for a bit, the cast is exceptionally too large, filled with characters whose only purpose is to add validity to the plot being a series of organized parkour games, the rushed romance only serves to stand in the way of the themes which are brought up and drowned halfway through to make room for a straight retelling of The Little Mermaid, and it feels like the concept is having a constant duel with the script, leaving neither with enough spotlight to feel impactful. And all of that stretched out to a few pages could be the review. But first, there are others who can make much better dissections of an anime's technical elements than me, and second, I think my style lends itself much better to positivity, or at least I'm really trying to be more positive for my own sake. So in the spirit of both of those points, we're not going to look at how Bubble failed. We're going to acknowledge where it did, once again state that it's average at best, and then look at what helps to balance out those negative elements to reach a neutral score. This is most of what Bubble did right. Let's start with something I think is almost like a bit of wasted potential. The anime presents us with a microcosm of life. This is explained by Makoto here. It's said that the world repeatedly collapses and rebuilds, assembles, bursts, scatters, then assembles again. And it's not just empty prose. Uta is one of these bubbles which was given a human form by Hibiki's breath, allowing her to save him from drowning. However, when she returns to that source and touches him, she begins to turn back into bubbles. She grows, learns, and loves throughout the course of the movie, but at the end of the day, she can only return to the source, which then gives rise to more life. It's a fairly simple cycle of life as we all go through the same process, bound by the fate that all things are taking from a limited pool of energy. For one bubble to form, others must burst, scatter, and then group together again, just like for a tree to grow, it must take nutrients left in the soil from the death of other life. Then bringing it into society as they do visually while this monologue is playing incorporates ideas like the Strauss-Howe generational theory. It states, roughly summarized, that society moves in a cyclical pattern of four stages. High, awakening, unraveling, crisis, and then back to high. It's a repeating pattern of major events, the collective reaction to them, the fading of that reaction, the rejection of what came from it all, and then another major event. Again, it works within the bubble metaphor. The bubble is gathered up together in response to some kind of input from some kind of energy. That same force then allows it to expand, but also makes it closer to breaking, which it can then do with minimal input, like a rejection of that very energy where its scattered atoms can then reform into more bubbles. Looking at life in society with a very visually distinct and easy metaphor could have led to great things. Unfortunately, I think the idea isn't really resolved well enough to dig some meaning out of the rubble. It just kind of states life and society are like bubbles, and then leaves it hanging in the air, moving on as it's swept up in other desires and other half-assed things the movie wanted to explore. But again, others will get into how those elements which interrupted these thematic glimpses failed a lot better than I could here. But for an idea dealing with the collapse of life and society to some extent, you need a setting which somehow encapsulates two very distinct and opposing states destruction and creation all at once. And I think Bubble Setting does a good job of this, and for me, it was one of the high points of the movie for sure. It's a desolate swamp where Tokyo used to be. The roads and buildings are all in disrepair and crumbling, often falling to pieces with the slightest touch. The once grand structures of humanity are now beholden to the weight of a single life. They're adorned with advertisements from better times where the focus could be on such trivial things compared to the current situation. Yet the gravitational anomaly adds a sense of wonder to it all. It creates dangerous vortexes in the air, same with the water, but also lets the bubbles float freely. The round and light forms a stark contrast to the harsh edges of crumbling buildings and rubble. It feels like everything might not be lost. And we see that in the parkour tournaments held here. Amongst all this destruction, there's the vibrant energy of life, complete with absurd teen names, bright colors, and the cheering of crowds. 
They risked their lives nonchalantly among these dangerous obstacles, adapted to their situation and finding a way as life famously does. They live on reclaimed navy boats, scavenge canned goods from below the water, and raise gardens on rooftops. This is a single picture that could have been used to explore the idea of collapse and rebirth, a cycle of life which exists in spite of and because of other life all at once. This isn't even mentioning that the setting is what allows the framing of parkour tournaments to exist in all its glory, complete with imaginative and insane routes, maybe a little too undefined to follow for a true sense of scale or tension in the races, but made up for in terms of sheer imagination and animative potential. I can feel how much fun they must have had putting together these shots because they had an open playground to make whatever they needed, whenever they needed, to create the most engaging shot. It's grand, unique, stunning, and many, many more positive adjectives I could list as if they did anything more than what your eyes are observing right now. But in all of this big picture stuff, the small details that make or break it aren't lost. The idea that a bunch of orphan children exist in this space solely through sanctioned parkour tournaments is a bit ridiculous. While the setting can be explained away because of imaginative desire, the people living in it aren't such. Although whimsical settings may exist, people tend to still be people even in stories. And with the limited time of a movie, you have to do extra work to find this believability. Let's look at one case, when the group sits down to eat and some of the small things that make it feel like they've truly developed a stand-in family connection here, which then entails a sense of normality and grounding to it all. They all have mugs hanging on carabiners in the ship with their names handwritten on them, an act of making things as homey as possible without being able to go out and simply buy something to do so. They just have to make do with what they have, and they do so to play a sort of family game since they're all alone outside of each other. When Hibiki returns after running off, Makoto and Usagi run out in chef outfits, something that's only seen and not mentioned, which makes sense for the most excitable and vocal of the side cast. They would be the ones to really get into it that much, and it makes them feel more real, giving them a bit of depth and adding to the idea of making a family, that they're having fun with it. When there's not enough eggs to go around, they shoot for them, playing rock, paper, scissors with a bit of passion, but also efficiently because they've clearly done this before, this is a usual, everyday occurrence for them. And this one is purely a background detail, so I'll even have to play the audio here for you to see what I mean. Oh, what's her name? Uh. And these three are all just examples in one category. There's a lot of small things like this that follow the golden rule. Show, don't tell, trust your audience, something I've screamed at so many series over the year on this channel. Many have ideas for details like this, but make them the center of attention, make them a big deal the characters specifically mention and call out because effort was put into such details and the creators don't want them to go unseen, especially if they relate to the main ideas. Bubble, for all its shortcomings, didn't trip into the sadly usual pitfall, and instead made its imaginative world feel much more believably vibrant by letting these things play out as they would in real life. Just simple details in the background. <laughs> they will be next. <laughs> I should stop that. Some similar work is done with the minor characters. I don't want to spend too much time on them here because it's more a case of playing really well to the limited time of a movie than technically doing anything really well, but I think it's worth mentioning as a success in that right. Now, they needed a large cast to facilitate the framing of the story. There simply needed to be multiple teams. So each team gets a leader who you can say a few distinct and definitive words about. The Undertaker's leader is this alternative and odd, strange movement and speech pattern thing speaking through her hand. Again, it's a little bit hard to describe, but you get the idea of it. The Mad Lobsters and Denki Ninja's leaders play off of each other. One is an intimidating but well-meaning lunk, and the other is a serious and calculating leader. But then they come together in the spirit of the game they love, and they have this comedic little feud about the Mad Lobster's habit of sniffing scented toys. It's odd, but again, it's... Uh, things that aren't really too deep, but you can explain them and, and get a sense of them fairly easily. It's nothing special, and I think the concept is still at war with limited time, but it's kind of what needed to be done to make it work. They don't feel like real people, but they feel close enough when you're looking at them out of focus in the background behind better characters. They each have that one memorable detail that stands out a little bit that you can get across with a simple description. No one's ever going to love these characters, but they did the job is basically what I'm trying to say. 
Hibiki is another positive of the anime, speaking of main characters, because he's the use of those small details I've been harping on to create a nice pocket of representation. At least, at first, we have to address how it falls apart immediately afterwards. But he's a character with auditory hypersensitivity, something that's directly confirmed later on into the movie here. But it's not an aspect of his character that's just dropped into the mix, it's carefully shown to us in a natural and engaging way. His proper introduction is mid-match in a game between his team, the Blue Blazers, and the other team, the Denki Ninjas. One of his teammates makes a bad decision and needs saving, at which point Hibiki enters to do so. When he does, the soundtrack quiets down, mostly giving way to the sounds of his movements. It stays much more subdued through his save and introduction until he removes his headphones, at which point a flood of sound comes rushing back in, complete with a visual pairing of chaos, then, paired with a literal focus, locks onto one sound as the soundtrack once again moves out of contention, only swelling up to match the height of the action after this moment of calm, after the point has been made. It's a moment of sheer double duty, laying the groundwork for his auditory sensitivity while also simply being engaging. It's not slowing down the action to state something and then get back to it, but creating a natural dip in the race to highlight what comes after it, a point between the save and then the highlight of action that comes after it. To further this, there's a scene later where Makoto tries to sneak up on him, failing even though he's wearing his headphones. Well, that's a very simple reminder. What follows when she does steal his headphones is more telling. While he panics somewhat at first, he calms down, despite obviously being uncomfortable, and simply asks for them back rather than grabbing for them. This, when compared with the first time he removes his headphones when he does so by himself, is important. The first time, he was mentally prepared, in control of the situation and knowing what he was about to do. Here, it was a surprise. They were simply ripped off of him, and he reacted instinctively before adjusting. And that word, that adjustment, is what makes him very relatable to me. I can't speak to how well all this represents auditory sensitivity specifically, but I can say it does a very nice job with sensory issues from my perspective. I'm a very easily overwhelmed and fidgety person for lack of a better word. My pointer fingers have this odd curve because I used to bend them to my other fingers constantly. It was just one of my habits. I'm pretty uncomfortable around people, especially a lot of them, so I put that energy into little habits like that. I say I am and not I was, even though I don't react in the same way now because I've simply adjusted. Once I started paying attention, no one else seemed to react to things in the way I did, so I started to match their behavior and suppress or alter my own in some ways. It was just really the natural reaction to finally paying attention and seeing that. Now I'll just keep something on hand to mess with, you know, things like that. If I'm prepared for a situation that I'm usually uncomfortable with, I can do it, but I'm awful with spontaneity because it simply leaves me unprepared. So when I see Hibiki going from these very obvious behaviors as a child to these more reserved ones when he's older, specifically really the fact that he's avoiding people because they're pretty much guaranteed to cause such situations, I understand it and really relate to it. And this is before they even state exactly what's going on with him, which doesn't feel like some forced inclusion at the end of the movie because it's been introduced in very smart and very smooth small doses, which never interrupted the story beforehand. This is like what was done with those other characters to an extreme. You have limited time, so you craft a character around a couple core ideas. You incorporate those ideas into the very story and setting itself, making them feel natural in doing so, in his case, all while representing something in a very real and sensitive and meaningful way. That is until they fuck it all up. Where Bubble really falls is in sidelining everything else for developing a terrible romance, and Hibiki's condition is sadly no different. It needs to be out of the way for the finale, so that's what they do. They make it go away with the power of love. Because he talked to it, Uta about it once, and because he fell in love with her, he simply kind of gets over his auditory sensitivity. In case you hadn't noticed, that's not how it works. You don't just get over it, you manage it. That's what I liked about what they were showing us earlier. You don't go from avoiding everyone because they have the potential to cause you distress for years to putting yourself right into the middle of one of those situations overnight because of the power of love or whatever bullshit you want to call it. What I liked about his character before was that it showed the careful management and unhealthy habits that could form from it. It had a subtle moment where conformity showed how powerful it can be for better 
or for worse. Watching that, which is also the source of his development and a large factor of his character, be thrown out in an instant to make his arc nothing more than simply boy becomes normal, feels so wrong as someone who's constantly struggling to make gains to live the kind of life I want to while also managing my own issues like that. In addition to it just being a damn boring and near pointless character arc. I said I was going to be positive, but this is something that I had to address about the series. I'm glad they at least did some justice at all with his character. I think more series should. I'll never complain that they only did most of it right, because most series don't do it at all. That's why I just spent a bunch of time praising it. I just really wish they had finished it right, because that's how you create a meaningful message. And watching love is the answer be the message to someone who's had a lot of failed relationships because of issues like this, it just feels a bit wrong. When I'm with you, I... Finally, we have Uta, probably the best part of Bubble, and I say that as someone who's generally not much for her kind of character at all, but appreciates how well they made it work in this instance. You can begin her character with one word, observation. Her starting point is based fully on things she's observed. When Hibiki goes on his tower run, he leaves a mark at the highest point he's reached before, making it a total of six. Without ever stating it, we know that he's done this before from that detail. When he later falls and Uta moves to help him, she comes across a cat that hisses at her. We can assume from this and the general state of things that there's a few cats that are now out and about, and that she's seen them before, if not gotten close to them. When she's given a human form, they describe her as a cat girl because, well, it's actually just accurate for once. She's also quite the immediate parkour master along with this, and that gives us two parts of her character so far then relate directly back to her observations, nimble cats and the agile Hibiki. She behaves like the cats more because she hasn't witnessed how Hibiki behaves yet, but she's likely been around the cats more so behaves like them, but she's seen him move so she takes after him in that way, it's a combination of the things she's observed. Her outfit is also a result of something like this. As she begins to transform, we can see an advertisement on the side of the train car Hibiki is trapped in, and that's the same outfit that she wears. She just took the form of what she was looking at. This is one of the best starting points for a character arc because it takes aspects from the story and then builds a character around them, then that leaves them open to learn and grow from what's around them easily because we've already seen them do just that. She's an exceptionally quick learner, but in this case, I'll buy it because learning is what she's all about. She observes the surroundings and matches them easily. It also makes her curiosity feel warranted rather than some cheap method for comedy or fan service moments like it usually is. She's taking in this new part of the world for the first time, of course she's going to be a bit all over the place. This also gives her one of the best small details of the entire movie. When she touches Hibiki, she begins to return to bubbles, and the change doesn't reverse. Later, when she sticks her hand in boiling water to explore her surroundings, Makoto rushes to dunk it in cold water, but Uta observes that this contact didn't make her bubble up. She touches Makoto again just to be sure, before later that night testing on Hibiki. Very naturally and completely in line with her character and its origins, she learns about this key factor of her life and the end of the story. And that middle test where she touches Makoto could be completely written off or overlooked because it is so natural and we're being trusted as an audience to understand her character, a simple idea that's being expanded upon. Now, I abhor the Little Mermaid sections of the movie. I think it's one of the most rushed and underdeveloped romances I've seen, and somehow I feel like it adds nothing to a simple short story for children. But when you look at Uda as an observer, it makes sense from her end, at least. She knows nothing about what love is because she's just now being introduced to human society and the remains of one at that. She also takes in her surroundings very easily, and so when The Little Mermaid is the first love story she reads, she relates to it, relates it to her situation, sees it as valid, and takes it that that must be what love is, as the book says it is. It's simply another case of her learning from her surroundings. So although it doesn't, least, doesn't suddenly make love at first sight a deep and meaningful idea, it does at least make for a character who could readily believe in such a thing, and I feel that it makes sense within her character, although not really being great 
outside of that. And I think that's just about all of my thoughts on Bubble, an absolutely stunning mess. If you want a number to put to it, it's a 5 for me, perfectly middle of the road and watchable. It looks great, the story has some interesting ideas and some awful ones, and it all bounces out to create something I'm perfectly fine having spent a couple hours watching, but would never go back to. But my taste certainly isn't for everyone, so what did you think of Bubble? I spoke to a few fans about it last week, and we seemed to agree, but the rating is a couple points higher than mine, so I'd love to see if I'm simply overlooking something here, because believe me, when it comes to negative reviews, I'd rather be proved wrong, because that means that a story is simply better than I thought, and who doesn't want more good stories? Anyway, this uh, script was, or this video's production time was a little bit shorter than usual. It was um, not outlined and scripted and recorded in the same day, but scripted and recorded in the same day, which I don't usually like to do. So I hope it didn't come off as too rough. I think it is a little rough around the edges, but uh, with a crazy week, that's just kind of what we're working with here. But I hope that didn't hamper the experience too much and I hope I was still clear and concise enough in my points here today but anyway I could feel the ramble coming on so I'll just stop and mention four important links in the pinned comment twitch which we'll get back to eventually for streams I think we're going to do some short story streams uh, when we do get back to it once things calm down a bit uh, twitter where there's some random thoughts and you can see when videos are released and stay up to date and so on uh, Discord, where we have a community going where we chat about some of our favorite animes, and most importantly, Patreon, where you can get your name at the end of videos like these lovely people above me right now. But anyway, I'll just say thank you for watching, and I hope I'll see you again soon.